<laughs> All right now. Acts 2, 46 and 47. <clears throat> the Bible says they worshiped together at the temple each day. So important. Gatherings like this are so important. They worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Let me, let me read it like this. They worshiped every week at Mosaic and then they joined a connect group and had fellowship in their homes. <clears throat> you should be doing both. <laughs> that just sounds right. That, that's the daily version. Obviously it don't count, but anyway, you get the point, right? They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And this is a sentence that I love in the verses. It says, and each day, not just on Sunday, but each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I, I, I'm expecting someone to get saved this morning because here we are in our large gathering. But with the deployment of these groups, I'm expecting daily reports of people that are coming to your group uh, that have been invited that are not followers of Jesus becoming followers of Jesus as a result of that. Each day, say each day. Father, we love you today and we praise you in this house and we are just declaring that we are not afraid, but we are entering into a new level of commitment today, God. We are being tied down to this moment of co conviction and this moment of confidence that God, you who have begun a good work in us is able to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for those that are tied up, they'll get loose today so they can get tied down to a greater purpose. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. Come on, as you get in your seat, look at somebody and ask them the question and say, are you tied up or tied down? Are you tied up or tied down? Tied down is what you say to that lady that's trying to get in between you and your wife. Tied up is the excuse that you use when you don't want to do group life. Well, I'm going to come today with both barrels blazing. We're better together. We're better together. I was sharing with some of our Connect Group hosts that are emerging at yesterday's training, and I said, I, I used a passage out of the book of Exodus where it said, and Moses was content. Moses was content to simply get a wife and look after some sheep and live. He was content. But there was a cry going on in the region. There was a cry in Egypt and God wasn't going to allow Moses to be content just to go through the motion and live life in the way that he wanted. He disrupted him. And God said, I heard the cries of my people in Egypt and I've come down to do something about it. Right? And I'm like, go, go God, go on with your bad self. Right? And then the next thing out of God's mouth to Moses was, now get up, I'm sending you. Uh, the move of God that you and I long for won't happen until you move. If you're waiting on God to do something independent of your participation, you're going to die waiting and never experiencing. God does not do it in the earth unless he does it through someone. When he wanted to save us, as he has, right? What did he do? God became a man, the man Christ Jesus. Could have just waved his godly wand over us and saved us. But he doesn't do anything in the earth that he doesn't do it through someone. And that's why prayer is important tonight, by the way. Because anytime you open your mouth and begin to pray according to the will of God, you are loosening what is liberated in heaven into the earth. Jesus said you have the power to bind and to loose things in heaven on the earth. If that wasn't important, then why did he tell us that we had the power to do it? And your mouth is a portal. Yeah, some of us have bigger than others, but yes. If you wouldn't mind, would you please take your wife to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 when we leave this service and 
teach her what the Bible says about our corporate gatherings. Anybody else got anything to say? You got anybody else got anything to say? I'm just playing. Maybe. <laughs> I need to do a teaching on that, don't I? I mean, I really need to do a teaching so because I use it in my to my own advantage, but it doesn't mean that at all. And so I know some of you may hear me saying that he's right. She needs to shut up. <laughs> but it it doesn't mean that at all. It it, it doesn't mean that at all. I like to use it that way, but Oh, don't act like you're not the same way. Don't you have certain scriptures that you use to your advantage as well? I'm moving on. The Lord said to me yesterday, he said, I am moving and I will continue to move, but my movement is aimed at moving people. And so he sends Moses to liberate people because God heard their cries and he found somebody that wasn't going to live in contentment, that was willing to go. And, and this is what he didn't do. He didn't send him alone. He didn't send him alone. He's got the rod, he's got the power, but he doesn't go alone. Because along the journey, you're going to need an Aaron and you're going to need a her to hold up your arms when you are just fatigued with the whole process. When you feel like quitting, you're going to need somebody that tells you you can't. You're going to need 70 elders, Moses, to get around because there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel that you're going to need to just share a story and share a thought and get some feedback from some other people that can hear God too. Are you with me? And you're going to need some Joshua's to fight in the battle and to, loose, to lead uh, people into their promised land because you're not going to be able to carry everybody to the place God's called them. You are a facilitator and God has called us all to facilitate this thing together. And that's why we're doing groups here at Mosaic is because life is not meant to be lived alone and you cannot be content to, to just go on about your business while the world around us is going directly to hell. Yeah. And if you don't believe that this world is going to hell, go take a trip around this city on Friday nights. Go to some non-religious events. Expose yourself to the crisis. I drove through the city at four o'clock this morning and there were people that had been out all night standing on the roads, walking down the roads, and you can just see them. Weight loss falling off of them. There's a crisis going on. Lives are being lost. And the Bible says this, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. If you're playing it safe, you're wrong. Your life is not your own. Well, I don't feel called to that. That's what a guy told me one time that felt like he was called to preach. I'm on the soapbox if you don't know. Guy's called to preach. He, he tells me, he's in the office, he says, I'm called to preach. I want to preach. I feel like God's raising me up. I said, go to the nursing home. And we'll call down there and talk to the administrator. And I'll tell you what you can do. We'll set up a service and you can go down there and you can just preach as much as you want to. He went one time, come back to me. He said, God hadn't called me to that. <laughs> I threw my Bible up on the desk. I said, well, can you give me a scripture for that? Yeah. What he wanted was the platform and a microphone. I'm grieved. I'm very grieved at the condition of this world, and I can't even be content. It's one of like the best seasons ever in the natural for me and my wife. It's like the best season ever. In some ways, as, as it relates to our life and lifestyle and the goodness of God that he's just led us through some decision making, I'm like, this is it just, it's the best, and I, I can't even find myself to relax and be satisfied in it. Because everywhere I look, Lives are being ruined. People are in fear. I don't know where they're coming or going. We'd rather see a lawyer over our marriage than go into the closet and pray about it. You know? Wives being abused in, in the homes by the husbands. And by the way, I'm just going to dig on this just a moment because I'm just already here and I'm going to go with it. If you put your hands on that woman... You are a coward. You are ridiculous. You need a grown man to take you out behind the woodshed 
and teach you something about honoring glory to God. Because so there's a better way to communicate than putting your hands on somebody and beating them glory to God. We're hearing stories like that. And it, I'm like, what, what is going on? How did you raise those hands on Sunday and then raise them to hit her on Monday? What is going on? Yeah, and that ain't the church down the road, unfortunately. It's worse than this one, but it's not the church down the road. It's happening everywhere. We got kids in our student ministry that will get a razor blade in their hand and cut themselves down their forearm to feel the pain and to watch the blood drip so they can know they still got life flowing through them because they are so numb and, and dead. Suicide is like the, out of the top seven things that people die as a reason of death in this state, suicide is like number seven. And by the way, COVID's not even on the list. It's what angers me too. Who are so concerned about people's life. Why don't we give them insulin free then? Why, why aren't we giving cancer treatments free then? Why aren't we dealing with heart disease, the number one killer? Folk don't care about people, they care about their agenda. They don't care about people, they care about their agenda. No, I'm on the stump today, if you don't. I told you I was feeling heavy. <laughs> you and I have been given a gift. The power of God coming to rest upon us. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead as followers of Christ, we've received that. We receive that Holy Spirit, and not just somebody, not just Pastor Daly or somebody that's on the planet. Every follower of Jesus has been given this special gift, this ability that comes not by your ability, but by the Holy Spirit. You have a gift. That, that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says. He, it is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift the person should have. He, the Holy Spirit, knows you so well. He puts this gift in your life. And not only does he put your gift in life, but he puts you in position to be powerful. The Bible goes on and says, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, he said, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part where he wants it. He deposits this supernatural ability on you and then he makes you part of the body of Christ so you can use the supernatural ability that he has given you. And he knows that you're jacked up and junked up and you got all kinds of issues. So he don't just empower you and put you in place, but then he gives you access called the fruit of the spirit to his character so not only can I demonstrate him but I can act like him so the body of Christ can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might we need some believers to get back to the gym and start working out again because we've got con Tent, and we think life exists in the abundance of stuff. Money is not indicative of a blessing. For some of you, it's a curse. I can't gauge where I'm at with God based upon my bank account. You think Bill Gates can? There's a lot of people who got more money than all of us. And they hate God, they don't believe in God. Money is not the definition. The only way money's powerful is when it gets in the hand of somebody that has purpose in the kingdom of God and they start leveraging that money towards the advancement of who God is. God don't mind you having a house as long as the house don't have you. God don't mind you having a nice car. I prefer leather over cloth. But if I've gotten too good to ride on cloth, there's a problem with me, not with God. Help me, Jesus, somebody, right? I prefer to buy my clothes at Buckle instead of Walmart. But if I get too good to wear them from Walmart, there's a problem with me, not God. 
See, the problem is not what God wants to do in me. It's what the God is doing through me that becomes the hindrance to, to the purpose that God has for me. He has invested so much in all of us. You say, what are you talking about? I'm telling you, 2,000 years ago, a man called Jesus stretched out his hands on Calvary's cruel cross and was nailed to death so I can live and not die and declare the power and the wonder and the glory of my God. Man, I don't want to waste my life doing anything other than lifting him up. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. You are called to get the cross and lift it as high as you can. People should not be confused about who you're in love with. They should know that I'm crazy about Jesus. I heard a guy say, and you, hold, you can't say things like this anymore, but a guy was in the restaurant, he was showing me several years ago, and he said, I'm, I'm talking to a guy, and all of a sudden I got overwhelmed with the love of God. He said, I shouted as loud as I could, I'm in love with the man. He said, the guy on the other side of the table started looking around thinking, oh, glory to God. He said, I said it again, I'm in love with the man. He said, by that time, I had the attention of everybody in the... And he said, nobody was looking at me that was looking at the dude across the table from me. He said, when I had their attention, I stood up in the bench and he said, I'm in love with the man and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And I'm not ashamed. Come on, somebody. Come on, guys, if you're too tough to love Jesus, you're not strong enough to do anything. <laughs> I don't care. It's not even good English, is it? I've been around Pastor Tommy too long. He can't speak Spanish or English. We've been spending time trying to raise the value on the most controversial person in scripture called Holy Spirit. And we've been trying to raise the value of him in our lives and the need to live this life that God has called us to live. And we are de totally dependent on him. I, I, and so what I wanna do now is now that you have him and you understand something about him no matter what scale or wherever you're at on that, I need to tell you about what it looks like to live it. So we can talk about the manifestation, there should be power, people should get healed. People should get delivered. People should get set free. You should love your neighbor. You should love your enemy. You should do good to them that say, but what does it look like? From what place in this position should I act out and govern? Are you, where, where am I at on this? Well, I'm gonna tell you, I know a lot of people and I have a lot of conversations with, with some folks that say, we wanna be the church of Acts again. We should look like the church of Acts. And I totally agree. I mean, I totally agree. We should be, it's, it's the template. Some people call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit, but I tend to lean towards it's the Acts of the Apostles. Come on. Come on, yeah. It's the building of the church. And so if I want to find where success is and what it looks like to be a radical follower of Jesus and make a world impact, I don't need to look any further than the book. I can go back and while, yes, please God, pour out your spirit and let lame people walk again and deaf, deaf ears be unstopped and blinded eyes be opened and let dead people be resurrected and let cancers go and let COVID go to hell and all, and all of that. I, there's a place that I have to get up and live every day. The apostles did not, hear this, did not walk, eat, walk around simply wanting to demonstrate power. That's what they did sometimes. But what they did all the time was be in pursuit of lost people and uneducated people and people in ignorance, and it was through that vein of emphasis that they raised up a church that you and I have been engrafted in today. We're not here because, because the apostles raised somebody from the dead. Not 
like that in itself or because somebody got healed way back 2,000 years ago. We're not here. We're here because they took the teachings that they got from our Messiah when they were following him and they reproduced it in the ear of somebody else who became a follower. And then that follower reproduced that same teaching. There was gradations and variations of the demonstration of power through those individuals, but it was the message, the gospel, the truth that has been weaved down through history that has built the church that you and I are so humbly grateful to be a part. And the biblical illiteracy is crazy. It, it's crazy. People will believe what they read in the newspaper before they will the Bible. This season, th- listen, if I polled you and I said, tell me who believes what the news is saying. You'd be like, I ain't saying, that's stupid. Tell me who believes what the government is saying. No chance in hell. Right? But let them threaten your liberty, your safety, your security, and give you counsel to protect it, and you'll believe it like it's the truth. And the Bible speaks everything contrary to everything being said. And we're like sheep herded into a trough. The devil's coming for us. Did you hear what I said? He's coming for us. He hates us. He can't stand us. He hates everything about Jesus. And the moment you say, I'm a follower, get prepared. He's coming for you because he hates the son. If you love the son, he hates the son. And he hates everyone that hates the son. People, somebody said something to me. I'm on the stump again. People said something to me. They, they said, well, well, shouldn't we be concerned? And shouldn't we have wisdom? And shouldn't we do this? And shouldn't we do that? And shouldn't we do this? And, you know, put 10 masks on if you want. That don't mean you have godly wisdom. You say, what are you talking about? So denying what's happening in the world is not what God has called us to do. Making a difference in the world is what he's called us to do. Check this out. Because Jesus would say, if they put something deadly in front of you, drink it up. Ask no questions. They'd be like, what? Listen, I've been all over this world and they put some stuff in front of me that I've eaten before and I was praying the whole time it was going down. I mean, when that duck is like greeting you when you pull up in the driveway in the hills of China and all of a sudden the feet and the bill are sticking out of the pot and they're saying, get you some, that's a, that feels different. It just feels different. But there that word comes up right there and you get those sticks. I need a fork. Nobody got no fork. I don't know what's going on with this world. There ain't no forks and spoons in China and no toilet paper in India. I don't even know what's happening in this world. You go in the bathroom and there's a hose running in the bathroom. I come out and say, where's the toilet paper? No, it's a water hose. What? We don't do that stuff. (laughs) I don't know what point that was. I have no idea. (laughs) But I think a lot of people get stuck in in their faith with the response. And we're going to have one in just a moment. But I think a lot of people get stuck in their faith in the response. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, 38 says, Peter's words pierced their heart, and they said unto him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When the message was preached, Jesus is, I mean, Peter is simply preaching this about Jesus. God loved you so much, he sent his son Jesus. God approved who he was by many signs and wonders. A determined counsel took him, crucified him, and the Spirit of God raised him from the dead. And if you'll have faith in him, you'll live forever as well. That, that, was a, that was the message. And all of a sudden, the people that were gathered at Jerusalem heard that message. And they asked him, what must we do? 
What's my response to hearing that? What, what are you looking for from me? I get it. God loves me so much. He's done all this. What am I supposed to do? And they're simply saying, repent. Get your mind right. Change your direction. Get baptized. Identify with this Christ. Are, are you with me? T- t- change the way you're living. Turn from your sin. Change the way you're living. Change the way you're living. Change the way you're living. I don't know why people think they can get saved and keep living the same. No, the response is I am now going to change the way I'm living. Because I was living wrong. If I was living right, I needed not Jesus. So I had to change the way I'm living. Right? And I then received this gift, Holy Spirit. He's going to come and dwell in me. You know, but what he, what he doesn't do is he don't go on to tell them what the new lifestyle looks like. Because at this moment, at this moment, 3,000 people give their life to Jesus. It's a big baptism. One message, a mega church comes out. 3,000 people answered the call. They responded, like all of us in here that have raised our hand, answered an altar call, said the prayer, whatever it is, inviting Jesus by faith into your life. We've had that response, but oftentimes we just give the response and we don't make the commitment. And making the response comes with making a commitment. Having a response to that and saying, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus is an indication that you no longer are in control. Jesus now takes over the reins of your life and is able to lead you where he wants to go. And sometimes it's contrary than the place that you desire to be. Remember Peter, he tells him that. He said, when you get older, boy, somebody's going to take you to a place that you do not want to go. Jesus was telling him early on, before he launched him out, you're going to die. You're going to die. Who's signing up for that? Right? Oh, wait. I just told you he was giving me a Holy Spirit in life. You forgot the dying part in the message. You forgot the sacrifice part. You forgot the commitment. I just thought I just had to agree and accept that I can go on and live my life. No, 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 no. The conviction is supposed to convince you of something. The conviction is supposed to convince us of, of something. And I think God is saying to us in this season, we need to get tied down Amen. to a few things, yeah. right? There's a lot of us tied up, but I think God is wanting us to get tied down. Tied, tied up is an indication that you're trapped in something. Mm. Tied up means you're preferring something. Oh, tied down means you can't escape from something. That's what the Lord was ministering to this one. He said, some people are tied up thinking they're tied down. But they just made commitments based out of preference. And the thing about being tied up is you can untie yourself. The thing about being tied down is you have to have somebody else loose you. And God's looking for his folks to be tied down to some stuff. Committed, persuaded, sold out preferring him above everything else. And I get it. Some of you are in here thinking, well, I don't know what to do. I love Jesus, but I just really don't know what to do. I'm going to help you today. Because if you'll, if you'll, get, if you'll get tied down, one thing that will happen is you'll get stability in your life. Yeah. See, you're not con- called to control the waves of the world. There's a plan and purpose of God that's taking place. But what you can do is not be tossed to and fro by the waves of the world. That's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we have an anchor to our soul. When you say that you're a follower of a believer of Jesus, something wraps around you. He doesn't bring you out of the world. You're just tied to something that's out of this world. That when the winds start beating on your life, you're tied to something. I said you're tied to something. And and that something is hope and faith. Hope and faith because when you made a commitment because of the conviction... 
What happened is, is you were saying, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I believe because he lives, I will also. That no matter what happens to me in this life, man can kill the body, but he can't kill my soul, right? That the same Jesus that got out of the grave is going to get me out of the grave. Because when you've made, when, when you've let God put his rope around you, it doesn't mean that everything he's got roped is all good. There's still, because the, the, the euphoric moment of giving your life to Jesus, oh, it's great, right? But the new wears off. And you still got the same crazy wife. You still got the abusive boss. You still like pills. You still love alcohol. You still love to get a good chew of tobacco. You love to smoke a cigarette. You love to cuss. And those things can drag you right back into that old life. And it's nice to have something that when the storm comes to the new believer in Jesus that I'm tied to. If you lived out in the Midwest back, if you lived in the Midwest, you know what they'll do in, they'll have in the Midwest, they'll have what they call whiteouts. Whiteouts in the Midwest. That means that the blizzards will come so strong that if you go outside your house into the storm, it's easy to get disoriented and not even find your way. People have froze to death, killed by the elements within yards of their house because the, the, the sustained blizzard was so long that they just couldn't see and they're just turning circles in a space. Are you with me? So what they'll do is, is because chores still have to be done, they'll tie a rope to the door of the house and they'll run that rope out to the place that they're supposed to work. And if something happens between where they're supposed to be and what they're responsible for, they got something anchored back to the place so I can still navigate my way back to the storm. Are you with me? Jesus is able. Help, let me help you. Jesus will carry you through coronavirus. Jesus will carry you through cancer. Jesus will carry you through heart disease. Jesus will carry you through your sinful desires and oftentimes sinful behavior. Some of you need to get tied back to the place of where you began because somewhere along the line you left the house to engage a, a responsible world and you don't even know how to get back there. And because you know trouble's coming, you don't put the rope up when it's storming. You put the rope up when you have time and you can see clearly, when you can get the obstacles out of the way. Help me, Jesus. Look at somebody say, get tied up. Look at somebody say, no, get tied down. <laughs> being, being tied down helps me keep focused. Notice this, Acts 2, 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fel- all the believers, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. De- the word devoted is key because after you have made the commitment to be tied to your faith in Jesus Christ, devotion is required. Devotion. The, the word in the Greek means to be fully persuaded and connected and relentless. Devoted to it. I'm de- what am I devoted to? I'm devoted to the word of God. Not the newspaper. Not Facebook, that's not even news, by the way. Right? My daughter was sharing something a while back, and, 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 and I said, I haven't, it was, it was big time news. I was like, well, I haven't heard that. Where did, she said, it's all over the news. I said, really? I immediately got my laptop out, and I started looking at all the news outlets. And I went, I called her back, I said, I, it's not on any news outlet. That news is big. She said, no, I mean, it was on Facebook. That's not news. And now that they're censoring, you don't know what you're getting. You don't want none. You don't want none. (laughs) We're being conditioned with a doctrine. And you should be conditioned with the doctrine. But some of you will move off of noise on Facebook 
Share it, tweet it, tell it. There ain't a scripture coming out of your mouth nowhere. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you must be tied to teaching of God's word. You, it's, not, it's not an option. Wherein shall young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereunto, unto your word. God, Jesus didn't die to make every day a Friday for us. Right? You, you know, I heard something uh, yesterday that, 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 that they stopped writing theology books. You know why? Because they don't sell. People want self-help books, self-empowerment books, and we flock to things that we think should make us better, but there's only one thing that's going to change your life. It is the Word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. People ask me sometimes, they'll say, they'll say, Pastor, you know, because when I got saved, I was in a mess, a mess, right? I'm, I'm tied to my faith, but I got a mess in my rope, Right? And, and they said, how did you get clean? Did you go to rehab? What was the program that you used? What, I mean, what, what? I, I said, no. I said, I fell in love with the Bible. I couldn't even understand it. I, it was King James for me. They didn't have all the, I didn't even know they had these wonderful translations. It was just King James. That was the one Paul used, so I thought, let me use what Paul was using. I heard somebody say that like the truth. I, dude, that was in 1611. What are you talking about? They didn't speak English. Paul had the King James. Don't follow a person that says Paul had the King James, by the way. You know that dude don't know what he's talking about at all. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, people will say, well, I don't understand when I, when I read it. Well, it's not your job to figure it out. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to reveal the truth. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a new book, and when Marcus Tanker was here, he said something. He said, the Holy Spirit will keep you in Scripture from getting an error. I thought, that's a word. Because if you interpret it on your own, you'll reach conclusions that work for you. But if you let the Holy Spirit bring the revelation of God's intention out of that word, amen, it'll make a better you. And so I can remember, I would, I would not go to bed at night unless I had Alexander Scorby playing. It was cassette tapes back then. We didn't have CDs. It was cassette tapes. And every night I'd put Alexander Scorby in the cassette tape. And I'd hit the button and I would go to sleep listening to that word. When I come home at night, whereas I used to just party, I would literally go into the bedroom, throw my feet up on the desk and get this. It, I think it was a, uh, I forget the guy's name of the Bible, some, a Dakes Bible. It was a Dakes Bible. Boy, you'd read some of that commentary. It was a Dakes Bible. And I set it on my lap and I got my pack of camel lights out and I was blowing smoke rings reading the Bible. But what I didn't know is something was changing in me. And I find out that today, things that I haven't read in a long time, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just surfaced them up in the moment that I need them. And I believe that the way I got free was not because I had a moment and said a prayer, it was because I was dedicated, devoted to reading that Bible. It wasn't a devotion, I was devoted. It wasn't something I did in the morning just to check the list off, if you will, or hear somebody else's commentary to feel like, no, I was eating that word and I was eating that word and then I started judging everybody by it, right? I'm not recommending that, but I got into that phase too. Nobody loved Jesus like me after I got done reading. I got critical and judged, and, then, and, and then, then, then God had to bring me through some maturity. And, even, and here's what the word helped me do. It positioned me in a place that God can deal with me. Not you, deal with me. I remember I'm, I'm in, in, in the room there, got my feet up on the desk, I got my Bible on my lap, I've got my camel lights, and all of a sudden the wife says, hey, 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 hon, uh, the pastor's here. I was like, <laughs> waving smoke, you know? I was like, man, I still wish I had some of that incense from the old days. <laughs> I took that pack of cigarettes and I slid it up behind the monitor that was there on the, on the well, it was a roll-up cabinet. You don't even know what that, the furniture, they quit making that. And I slid it back behind there to hide it like I was hiding. And the moment I moved them like that, the conviction of the Lord hit me. I just started overwhelming me all of a sudden. I thought... Boy, if I'm ashamed for the pastor to see me do that, what about Jesus who's watching? What, what is he feeling like? If I hadn't have been reading that word, I might not have been in a place where the Lord can deal with me concerning things that were inhibiting my effectiveness. 
wasn't that cigarettes were sending me to hell, but I bet if I broke out a camel light right here and fired one up, you would have issues with that, <laughs> wouldn't you? You're like, a preacher ain't supposed to smoke. Well, if you don't think I should, you shouldn't. There, if Julie and I weren't married and I was trying it before I bought it, you're not here today. You're not coming to ask somebody to lead you, spiritually bring understanding. So why would you do what you don't want me to do? I, I promise you the same God that's dealing with me is the same God that's working on you. And it's amplified by that word you got to be they were devoted the next step from saying i am going to be a follower of jesus is to find a group of people that know something about him and and, and give your life to them they were devoted and here's the second thing to fellowship relationship devoted devoted to relationship you, you know you know what I, I can remember I, I, was, I was battling and I just knew I needed to get my life right and I was trying, I'd go to church and I went on a Sunday morning uh, before I made a full commitment to Jesus and I was there and, 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 and the pastor said, if you want to be saved, come. Obviously I wanted to be saved. My life was in hell. I was, I was tormented. Paranoia sitting on me deep. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. I'd be hiding up in the woods with my gun, watching the house, thinking somebody was coming. I was like losing my mind. Of course I wanted to be free. Right. And so I went, I, I, I answered the altar call, I ran up there, answered the altar call, I said, yes, I'm gonna give my life to Jesus. And I prayed the prayer and I cried the tears and I thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. And that week, that very week, that very week, I'm out on a late night pour. I, I poured a lot of concrete. I, I had a construction company. And so we was on a late night pour. It was cold and co concrete doesn't set up well in the cold. And it's about midnight, one o'clock and the concrete still hasn't set up. And we're out there finishing and trialing it all. And there was a guy that worked with me, had some cocaine. And so he's going to cut some lines out. And I'm thinking, man, I'm tired. Maybe just a few. So I snorted me a few lines while I was out there. And pretty soon I was right back where I was. I didn't go to church that Sunday. Condemnation set on side of me, so I just d started to do more. I started to cook that cocaine up and make me some rocks. I just got, de I got pulled away. Can I tell you what saved my life? Obviously, Jesus. Can I tell you what saved my life? You want to hear it? Yeah, yeah. Go to church again. Cycling. I'm cycling. And there was this dude there. His name was Danny. I didn't even like him. I mean, he was one of those guys that I thought, he thought he was much better than everybody else. I mean, you know, he wore penny loafers and members only jackets, right? It was like, who wears penny loafers and mem members only jackets? But, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and check this out. I, 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 need, I need to finish my story and come to my conclusion. He, 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 he said, why don't we hang out? Our church didn't do groups at all. I said, when do you want to hang out? He said, on Tuesday. I thought, oh, glory to God, that's going to be exciting. I thought, I'm, I'm going to go on. So he comes down the house. He picks me up. He'd been in church all of his life. He picks me up, and we're riding around. All of a sudden, we start randomly stopping at people's houses and just telling them about Jesus. Then he said, hey, you want, why don't we go to the nursing home and we'll just go down there and pray for people down at the nursing home. I'm, a, I'm on the ride, right? If that's where you're going, we're going to go. I fell in love with the nursing home. Then he said, why don't we do this? Why don't we go over to jail and see if they'll let us come in and witness to the, to the, to the inmates. I thought, they're not going to let us just walk up in the jail and start with, he said, let's just see if God will let us in. Walked up, literally walked up, knocked on the door like at nine o'clock at the jail and said, hey, we'd like to come talk to the dudes. They opened the door, brought us to the cell door. The guys gathered around and I'm just new in Christ and we're just telling them about our story and telling them about Jesus. That relationship displaced all the other relationships that I was giving my time to. One of the hardest things you'll have to do is commit yourself to new relationships. I kept getting spoiled, not because of them, but because of the path that they were on that I was joining them on. And I found myself being yoked all the time back to the old life because of relationship. That's why group is so important. Group is important because it displaces where you would normally go and how you would normally spend your time. And now you get to go hang out in an environment of people that are different. I didn't even like him. I liked his wife, but I didn't like him at all. He was like... 
That guy, that me and that guy have been all over the world together. He's like my best friend. We've traveled everywhere together, sharing and preaching the gospel of Jesus. He was saved 25 years before me and he lets me pastor him now. Think of how crazy that is. That relationship, you need group life. You need somebody that's different in you to get into your life and fill the void up so you don't keep running back to the same relationship. No, you gotta get strong, you gotta be devoted. Because this is the deal, life is gonna happen and we need somebody in the trenches when the bombs start going off to rescue. And what God is doing is he's making us heavenly medics. That's what we are becoming, heavenly medics. I did a funeral not long ago of a wonderful person and a wonderful family that is a part of our community here. Yeah, his name is Howard Harrison. And Howard went, on, went, to be, Howard went to be with the Lord not long ago, but during the time spent, I realized that he was a Korean vet, a bronze star winner. As I pressed in to understand through the family and understand what that war was like, because at this point, I'm like the rest of the people, sometimes the Korean war is like the forgotten war. That's even what they say sometimes. But I started leaning into Howard's story and I found the wonderful ways in which Christ will get you in the midst of people before the trouble starts so you can be the rescue when the trouble comes. And Howard is part of attachment to a Marine uh, uh, battalion. And so the Korean War is dying down. It looks like we've won. We're only five, six months into the conflict. It's, it's 1950 and it's November. And so to, to everyone's, uh, uh, MacArthur has done, went over to Korea. We're, we've won, we're coming out of here. There's gonna be this troop pulled back, but before we do, I wanna send this battalion of Marines with this attachment of, of army uh, personnel over into this region just to make sure we've snuffed out any final resistance. And so they, 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 they do that. They head over to this place called the Chosen Res Reservoir. It's called, they're, they're, they're iconic and they're called the Frozen Chosen. One of the most horrible battles in all of American history. And there Howard is being asked to attach to this uh, Marine battalion and march a long way in one of the remote parts of Korea at that time. A place where the climate in November was hostile. Every night it would be at least 25 below. On November 30th, 1950, it was 57 below. Not having the right gear for such a campaign they said that they were freezing to death. People was freezing and limbs was freezing. And so the, anyway, they got their orders and they're, they're marching. Guns are starting to freeze up. The oil on the guns was starting to freeze. All the rations would freeze. The water would freeze. It was blistering cold. It was horrible conditions for these 12,000 soldiers. They thought they were marching to just snuff out a last resistance, but what they didn't know is China had rallied to support North Korea. And China had sent 100,000 troops to gather around this reservoir and they marched themselves into one of the most hostile environments on the planet. Unbeknown to them, an enemy was embedded all around. And so while they're marching, soon the assault starts taking place. Assault just starts coming. And I was told that the, Japanese, uh, the, the, the Chinese were so underarmed that they sent people literally with forks and knives as the first wave. Pots and pans is what I was told. And so they would come flooding off this hill on this small group of people in, trapped in this reservoir and they would just send waves of these Chinese and, and, and the soldiers weren't having any problems with the people that had forks and knives. But they got comfortable and felt like they had it. And then the real battle started taking place. Mortar fire raining in on them. People that are dying, they couldn't even make sandbags to barricade themselves in. They took the frozen dead bodies and built shelters out of the frozen dead bodies. They tried to remain still and hide themselves from this invading army. It said that their boots become blocks of ice. They would have to stand in place so long. Coats not keeping them warm. Some die feeling the, the fatigue of starvation. America's trying to drop in supplies, but the supplies due to the climate were blowing their supplies over to the enemy's side. See, see, sometimes people think they have it until the real conflict starts. And those Marines were well-trained and they were well-able, but they were in a situation where they were outmanned and outgunned. The enemy had the, had the upper level. They were in a low space and the bombs were coming. And all of a sudden a mortar round hits near where Howard is. 
decimates the area that he's at. And when the, and when, when the smoke cleared, the instincts of training and purpose kick into Howard. And he would run in the midst of the rubble and the mortifier raining down. And he won his, won his bronze star because he dug people out of the debris and saved people's lives. That's the kind of church and that's the kind of moment that we're in. That there's mortar fire raining down on people everywhere. And God needs some Howards, some heavenly medics who are standing in the battlefield but who are well equipped that if anybody needs me to come to the rescue, I am well able and I'm not gonna pay attention to what the media says and what the government says and what fear is saying. No, I'm not gonna run for shelter and try to protect me and mine. No, I'm gonna risk life in order to save life and at the end of the day, he drug people out that would have been lost forever. You and I in this semester have a chance to get some people out of the rubble and it's hard work and nobody wants to do it, but you've got to be tied to a greater purpose than nine to five and the comfortabilities of every day. No, I want to drag some people into the kingdom. I want to help people get out of the mire and the rubble of the explosions that life can be. And group life is the place that we get to begin doing it. Stand to your feet.